The Wonder Swan was a system that never left Japan, which makes it home to a bunch of titles few Gaijin played and fewer talk about. This video will be a brief overview of every Digimon game for both the Wonder Swan as well as its coloured successor. These won't be deep reviews, and some won't be reviews at all because my Japanese sucks and the uh, games are pretty basic, but it's an interesting topic. At least I think it is. Digimon Anode and Cathode Tamer are separate titles for the original Wonder Swan. They exist as partner releases, much like Pokemon, where the differences between versions are minor and a sad but probably successful attempt at filtering more money out of children and 30-something neckbeards. I won't be talking about these versions, however, as they were both re-released as a package in colour and in English for the Wonder Swan colour. Outside of getting a free Vidramon, I couldn't see any major difference, but he's extremely powerful and helped me beat the game with ease, so it's the definitive version. The game centered around some kid Kokvor RPing on his dad's laptop when he's blue balled by a power outage. For some reason, the laptop turns off too, but then an Argumon appears on the screen and begs the kid to come to the digital world to save the crew from the original anime series. With up to three Digimon in tow, you trudge through grid based dungeons, mindlessly dispatching the same generic throwaway monsters in turn based combat. I'd say it's a strategy game, but the only strategy required is to set the AI to automatic and do anything else, because it's not fun and every battle plays out exactly the same. The goal is to slowly shuffle along these gigantic maps two or three spaces at a time, taking fire from magic abilities that have no maximum range, as they play the same animations over and over until the enemies run out of casting points, after which you return fire with your own bloated magics. There's no tangible progression system, so monsters don't level up, and they don't digivolve, but their stats do increase in some mystical way. More playable characters are unlocked throughout the story, and foes can be captured with a digivice that slowly charges throughout combat, but they all seem to be more or less interchangeable as long as they were at least a champion and had a healing spell. A strategy RPG without a real progression system's one thing, but a Digimon game without digivolution is fucking insanity. They do pay homage to the virtual pet elements the series is rooted in, where hunger and poop appear as ailments, but all they do is bog down the AI winning the game for you and don't seem to have any major effect, as you're given a reusable toilet to cure the poops and meat pays out like you're on chat roulette. The English translation was also choppy, you can tell it wasn't written by a native English speaker, or if it was, he was taking the piss. And based on the state of modern Digimon, not much has changed. It did have some level of connectivity, so you could ostensibly battle your Digimon against your friends, but having a friend is next to impossible, and one with a Wonder Swan? Not happening. Digimon Adventure Zero 2 Tag Tamer is a sequel to Anode and Cathode Tamer, and features a split narrative between Ryu, the fella from the last game, and Ken, a red colour swap. He's actually the very same Digimon Emperor from the second season of the anime series, before he donned the cape and, uh, edgy persona. I don't know much about the show, but I don't doubt for a second that this uh, punches a few holes in the plot. The perspective shifts between both boys as they clear the same dungeons with different monster squads, and though the gameplay is refined, progression is the same as the former game, where you clear a linear stretch of standalone dungeons until the credits roll. Said dungeons consist of a sequence of rooms, which occasionally feature split paths with stores and fellas you can chat with along the way. The end goal is the same regardless, but these parts are nice pace breakers from the dredge that is the combat, which is now traditionally turn-based, with a complete removal of the grid. It flows so much better, and even though the neat, albeit bloated animations are kept, you no longer have to schedule a whole day to shuffle around a giant map. It also features actual Digimon progression, with a very World 2 inspired approach, though again, nowhere near as bloated. Monsters acquire strength through fusion, which increases their maximum potential and ostensibly stats. There are still no levels, but there is an experience counter, which correlates with stat increases. Overall, the changes were solid attempts, but it's still a grindy, bloated mess. I had to stop myself making another modern Digimon game joke. Luckily, it would have two more chances to get it right, as this is only the second game in a series of four, but we'll save those for the end to spice up the pace a bit. gonna be upfront about this one, I don't know what's happening or why. I only played the first battle and not knowing Japanese kind of pushes me out of the pool of people who can accurately criticise a largely text-based game. If you do want to see a video about a good Digimon card game I can actually interface with, I'll leave one in the description. The sprite work was pretty damn good though, and the Wonder Swan had this feature where you could flip the screen's rotation, so the vertical layout was taken advantage of too. It's really interesting tech, but a pretty poor game. At least at face value. 
Digimon Battle Spirit is a simple, arena-based fighting game. You fight, you bite, you collect orbs, and the mon with the most orbs wins. It's not very good, and was eventually ported to the Game Boy Advance and released in the West, so it's really just here to mention the Japan-only enhanced re-release, uh, Battle Spirit 1.5. Which is the same game with more characters. Kind of redundant when Sukumon's already in the base game, like, why would you need anyone else? Battle Spirit Digital Frontier is the same game that would eventually be ported to the Game Boy Advance and localized as Digimon Battle Spirit 2. Actions feel more intentional than the former, with it featuring power-ups, differing directional attacks, ultimate techniques, and clunky as sin boss fights. Despite being deeper than the first title, it's still largely mashing B and collecting balls. Ultimately, it's a basic fighting game. There's not much to say about the series other than to briefly mention that it exists. Or at least if there is more to say, I'm not the guy to say it. Are you British? Good, just checking. Have you ever wanted to kill a monster by yelling milk tea? Which implies that the natural state of tea doesn't include dairy yum yums? Well, Digital Partner might be the game for you. A majority of the gameplay is talking. You talk to potential allies, talk to kill potential allies, and talk to Digimon you've captured and secured in your basement. This seemed like another game with no real objective, and like speaking to Digimon was a means to get stronger monsters to pit against your mates. It does have random encounters, but the only progression seems to be Digivolution coming from randomly dropped items. Looking back at my game capture, I feel like I missed the point entirely, and there's a good chance of that given that this title was supposed to communicate with the PlayStation, or the Pocket Station in some capacity with a peripheral called the Wonder Wave. But as a standalone experience, it features minimal content. Talking sucks, real men solve their problems with their fists and magical beams. While we're on the subject, the Wonder Wave was an add-on that came bundled with at least one Digimon game and allowed for infrared transmissions. A spoiled Japanese child could connect their D3 Digivice to a Wonder Swan, transferring monsters to Digital Partner. From there, the Wonder Wave could blast these little fellas to the PlayStation peripheral, the Pocket Station, for use in the Pocket Digimon World series. If you know anything about what I just said, we probably read the same Wikipedia article. It's not the most efficient transfer method, but it is a cool relic from a long forgotten time, you know, before Wi-Fi existed, and I wanted to briefly mention it because there's next to no information online. Digimon Tamer's Digimon Medley is one of the uglier games I've seen in my time. It looks so bad, I genuinely had to look up if it was an official game or a Chinese bootleg. Once the battle scenes roll around, there is a significant uptick in the visual quality, but the way it functions is just as hideous. It's a turn-based RPG with no progression system, and while not as mind-numbing as some of the prior entries, it's still pretty bad. You select a character from a random assortment of the Digi Destined, and dodge random encounters as you move around tiny maps looking for the boss, so you can watch some cutscenes that loosely retell the story of the anime series. It's the same crappy nothing dungeons accompanied by the same crappy nothing combat system. It's barely worth commenting on. But I will! Combat is a 1v1 affair, where the player can interact with one of two minigames to boost their partner's damage output as the monster's Tamagotchi fight for digital supremacy. Winning random encounters grants the player EP, which allows them to do stronger hits and digivolve, so one or two of these before a boss and you'll get through with minimal difficulties. Items are scattered throughout the world and will occasionally be necessary, but if you've got the points to digivolve, your victory is pretty much guaranteed. Alongside healing, there are items to buff your boy, but they aren't necessary at all and ultimately burn turns. It's certainly no substitute for a progression system, but when your game's only a couple hours long, progression systems are tough to make meaningful. Even though some of the games I formerly mentioned had similar flaws, there was at least an attempted integration of social elements, and some sort of connectivity to inflate the incentive to play, but this is single player only as far as I can tell. It doesn't make it any worse, at least not in this context, but it is a baffling addition to what seems like a socially driven set of games. Digimon Digital Monsters Wonder Swan version is a bit of a mouthful, but it's also a VPET simulator that hints at being a video game. The goal is to build up a Digimon by cleaning its poop, feeding him, and ensuring a good sleep schedule so he can be pawned off in the store for more premium eggs that contain better monsters. The interface is almost identical to that of the late 90s craze, though you're able to manage up to 8 fellas at a time, which is a torturous hell, why would you ever do that? Core gameplay is basically the same as a Tamagotchi, though it does come with a few quality of life changes, such as the ability to manually skip large chunks of time and lock in your Digimon in a fridge. 
It features a single player campaign, if you could call it that, where you can run through five battle arenas to earn money, and completing each unlocks a new form of training, but the battles are solely AI controlled and luck based. Each dig man has a point value, with battles only allowing up to a collective 100 points. Champions are 50 each, and the cost goes down the lower stage they are. It is interesting to see a valid case for using weaker monsters, not something you see too often in these games, but since it's all automatic, any praise is a shallow attempt at being fair to something that's not really a game. It also comes in Japanese and English, which is cool, though with most interactive elements being simple graphics, language barriers aren't really an issue. After you beat it, it insists that there's more content to enjoy, and that's mostly true, as physical versions came with a Wonderswan attachment which let them interface with the original Digimon Tamagotchi things. Here's a video showcasing how this works, and it honestly looks like a great time. A link to the full one will be in the description. Digimon Digital Monsters D Project is another VPET game, but this one's a lot more involved and was easily my favourite. It starts with the handheld itself getting super hacked by a little bitch ass monster, and then some planet, possibly the digital world, gets overtaken by numbers as well. All the good Digimon get turned into bad boys, and the protagonist is tasked with putting in random strings of numbers to summon help and resources to get his accounts back. To get your first Digi Egg, the game forces you to input a string into a code terminal. But this machine grants differing eggs based on the first three numbers you input, and I'm unsure what the four sequential numbers do, but they're there too. A variety of meats are also obtained from a similar machine, only with a lower digit count, and medicine's given out for free without a password. I have a lot of questions, none of them are worth asking. The codes aren't one-time uses and can be called upon as many times as you can be asked inputting them, but it seems like the system was designed around brute forcing numbers until you get what you want. I imagine sharing more effective and interesting codes with friends was the intent, and I can definitely say I benefited from this, as GameFAX is a good friend of mine, but it's obtuse and slows gameplay down a little too much with the constant need to go back home and punch in numbers. The gameplay itself is neat, it's like a streamlined V-Pet where you feed your monsters and battle them with a punching bag until you're strong enough to tackle story battles. Digimon can be let loose to roam any given map or ordered to follow the player which prevents them from pooping. They are required to be let loose when they're tired, or when the time comes to digivolve, and their resulting form is derived from the type of map they're in, where a forest will always grant worm mons and sting mons, but I don't think there's any other benefit to free roaming. Monsters can evolve from their baby to their champion stages, and if you're lucky, even further beyond, but only during battle. Combat mostly plays out on its own, with parties of up to three on either side, but you can press a button as your monster attacks and defends to deal more damage and block respectively. Clearing story monsters unlocks more areas, which allows for more evolution types and whatnot. It's all a bit kind of samey and dull, but I love how weird it is. Time can also be sped up to quite an insane degree, so the wait for Digivolution isn't too bland, though if you're at the max speed, you'll be bashing the meat machine frequently. It's a pretty chill experience if you're keen to waste some time waiting for evolutions to occur and can stomach some of the more obtuse elements, but like every other Digimon title on the Wonder Swan, it's not great. Digimon Adventure 02 D1 Tamers. Unfortunately, as impressive as the name is, the game is basically a copy paste of the last one, only without Ken. While this entry does spice some things up, and the removal of Ken makes forward motion much more enjoyable, it's still married to the same bloated combat and progression systems. There are periodic tournaments against other tamers, which is a neat addition, but they're also fully automated and seems like more of a compensatory inclusion for the lack of a Digimon Emperor. Progression seemed a bit less grindy, and the map layouts were slightly better designed, but overall if you showed me a black and white screenshot of D1 next to Tag Tamers, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I mean, unless Ken was in it. Digimon Tamers Brave Tamer is the final shot at a really quality Digimon title on the Wonder Swan. Was it successful though? Uh, kinda. The best parts come from the revision and expansion of basic mechanics, but more or less it's the same fucking thing. In addition to monsters now having levels and digivolving to new forms based on those levels, their stats can be customized with plugins, additional techniques can be added, and even the way their stats are distributed can be weighted and shifted to make a fully personalized monster. This is expanded upon further because of the fact that everything in Brave Tamer takes the form of a card. Cards can be bought, fused, and used in a whole host of ways, and the Digimon capture system from the former titles has been rejigged to capture random monsters and turn them into cards with their own abilities and effects. The combat's more simple with the removal of the field view and appears solely from the side on view. 
the attacks and sprites are reused again, but the streamlining makes it more forgivable. The story's also far more involved and focused than the last titles, despite it being a direct sequel. So at the end of the third game, Cockvor Kid gets blown the fuck out and sent to this weird world where light beams are actually shops, and the new look helps it feel distinguished and evolved. There are also meaningful options made when progressing the story, as at each major point the player is presented with multiple doors, each with a unique interaction behind it, but you can only do one. These events actually dictate your party makeup, as whoever's behind the door joins permanently. All of these small changes compounded would make a legitimately amazing experience, if not for one teeny tiny issue. Uh, playing the fucking thing. Stage has got a big rework and now function more like a Zelda dungeon where it's a top-down mini labyrinth featuring the same room copy and pasted 50 times. The dungeons weren't so bad in the last games as while they were mindless they were also short. Here you've got to plot a very specific path to what might be the end based on where the corridors ostensibly end but due to combat and random encounters it takes way too long to move through them. It doesn't help that certain status ailments can wipe your party pretty easily and that game overs are actually punished with a reload now, unlike the past games where you'd just respawn at the house. Digimon can also be injured by overworking and are required to sit down for a few real world minutes, which seems silly in a game that features no other V-Pet elements. The grind also rears its ugly head in a new form, as cards require money to fuse and fusions required to get decent stat items and customizable techniques. So now, not only do you grind for experience, but for cash too. There are so many neat expansions here, and it pains me that they came so close to making a good Digimon experience, but the gameplay just kills it. If combat weren't so slow, the crappy dungeons could be forgiven, but all these smaller elements combine into a big ball of fuck, and that's the legacy left for the handheld that the West never saw. It might seem like I sped through a lot of these games, but there's honestly so little to say about them that all I could really do was give a vague description and say how shit they are. When I first saw the list of Wonderswan titles, I thought I'd stumbled upon a bunch of potentially amazing varied experiences and was really excited to dive in, but these games make the Digimon PS2 lineup look like the PS1 games. There's a pain in my soul knowing that Japanese kids were suckered into buying this crap, and I've no doubt that at least one of those tormented souls would uh, go on to become an anime fan. Bandai failed them, a generation lost to the Wonderswan Digimon titles, expelled from society, doomed to constantly jerk off to Renamon Rule 34.